recounts his transition from a proponent of the political left to one of its critics. This is about an hour. We are here today to celebrate the release of the first two volumes of David Horowitz's The Black Book of the American Left. These books trace David's journey from red diaper baby to the founding of the new left and then his abandonment of the progressive mission ultimately to convert to being a man of the right. This collection of David's writings follows his unique journey and offers incredible insights into how the left operates, rewriting history, championing totalitarian regimes, cheering for America's enemies, and doing everything they can to disrupt and undermine the American system. This is a story that only can be told by someone who has walked on both sides of the political aisle. Thankfully for us, that person has had the courage to take the arrows that have been raining down upon him for decades. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you David Horowitz. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, Harold Macmillan, uh, who this room is old enough to remember, uh, was a prime minister of England, and at the end of his long career, he was interviewed by a reporter who asked him, Mr. McMillan, what's the most difficult thing that you had to handle as a politician? What was most difficult about your political career? <clears throat> and McMillan said, events. <laughs> and that's, that's because events are the unexpected or often the unexpected. Um, I never thought that I would be standing here today um, as a conservative uh, with a book, actually a series of volumes about a movement that is running our country and ruining it, uh, the progressive so-called left. My parents were members of the Communist Party, card-carrying. Um, which means they were part of a vast international conspiracy that was indeed orchestrated from Moscow and they uh, were attempting to, or their goal was to create a Soviet America. Um, of course, they didn't call themselves communists. I never heard them use that word. They, they called themselves progressives. Um, my mother was also a registered Democrat. Over the course of the last 40 years, the communist progressive left that I grew up in had moved into the Democratic Party, started with the McGovern campaign, and today sits in the White House and runs the Democratic Party. Now, I know when you say, oh, the Democrats, they're communists. Uh, People will look at you and say, this guy is an extremist. Uh, he's a, um, a relic. Actually, I was called a relic by a Harvard professor in the New York Times for noticing that there's an alliance between the radical left in America and the Islamo-fascists. Um, that professor, Noah Feldman, is an apologist for the Islamo-fascists. Not surprising but it wasn't as though the New York Times identified him that way. <laughs> Valerie Jarrett and David Axelrod are Obama's two key advisors. One is political campaign manager and Jarrett manages everything else. Barack Obama, Valerie Jarrett, David Axelrod, all were born into the same communist left that I was all trained in the communist left, all graduated to the new left, which was formed by red diaper babies like myself, with the same political agendas. And they've never left it. And how do I know that? Because I am someone who did leave. And I will tell you, if you are part of a 
movement that you come to understand is destructive and deceitful, the first thing you want to do when you get out is to repudiate it and to warn other people about it. And they, of course, have it. But this is a, a mentality. And I have to understand, as I say, my parents call themselves progressives. Leftists may be delusional, but they're not stupid. So they understand that you don't telegraph your agendas because it will turn people off. When I was um, young, Stalin was alive, the slogan of the American Communist Party was, it wasn't Soviet America, dictatorship of the proletariat, take away the wealth and distribute it to our friends. Their slogan was peace, jobs, and democracy. There is a guru of the left named Saul Alinsky. Yeah, people are pretty familiar with him by now, a Machiavellian, um, who said, I mean, there's one message of the Alinsky book, which is don't telegraph your agendas, lie. Thus, if you want to introduce a comprehensive state-run health care system, otherwise known, that's communism. Uh, what you do is, first of all, you call it single payer, as though that's a very benign thing. It's not benign if the state controls everybody's access to health care, can decide what kind of health care you can get and what you can, and knows all your financial and health information. That's a totalitarian state right there. Um, secondly, you don't sell it as a totalitarian system, you sell it as we're going to insure the uninsured. And of course you all probably are by now familiar with the fact that Obamacare is not going to insure the uninsured. There will be 30 million uninsured people when it's over um, if there aren't 300 million uninsured people when it hopefully collapses. <clears throat> not, not too long ago, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is a extreme left-wing ideologue on the Supreme Court, who had only, only four Republicans voted not to confirm this ideologue, and is never referred to as an extreme left-wing ideologue, but that's what she is. Uh, not too long ago, recommended to the Muslim Brotherhood, which was then, thanks to Obama, running Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood, an organization whose spiritual leader has called in so many words for the extermination of the Jews that slaughtering Christians across the Middle East, supported, however, by the Obama administration, still support it. Ruth Bader Ginsburg's advice to them when they were uh, getting a constitution, uh, or a fake constitution, since the Muslim Brotherhood has a motto, the Koran is our constitution, that, that's their constitution. But anyway, she was advising them, and she said, I wouldn't recommend the American constitution. This is Supreme Court justice. I wouldn't recommend the American constitution, it's kind of old. I, I wish I was making this up. It's kind of old. I would recommend something like the South African constitution. The South African Constitution <clears throat> is the Stalin Constitution sort of, uh, you know, brought, brought up to date. Uh, its idea of rights, our, our founders idea of rights were limits to government. The Bill of Rights is all what Congress can't do, what the, what the government can't do, it protects the individual. The rights that we have that are positive rights are given by our creator, nature's God, so uh, enshrined in the Declaration. And, and why did they say that? Because if the government gives you rights, it can take them away. In this, uh, this Constitution is perfectly Orwellian. I mean, first of all, it guarantees the right to an environment free of violence. Madison called this kind of right a paper right. Well, it's never, you know, it's like the Stalin Constitution, and it'll never be fulfilled, this kind of right. South Africa today, its murder rate is seven times what the murder rate in the United States is. It's the rape capital of the world. Um, and of course, the, the left, which 
destroyed the previous regime, which was not an apartheid regime, which destroyed that, has completely abandoned South Africa. That's what the left does. It goes along, it gets everybody excited about the new world that's coming, and then it leaves disaster in its wake. In that constitution, it says discrimination is unfair unless it is established that discrimination is fair. That's a direct quote. <laughs> Did I mention George Orwell? <laughs> property rights. You have the right to property. Unless the government decides that it, for the universal good, they need to take it away from you. That's in the Constitution. It's a communist constitution, and it was written by communists. But our, now, the most important thing is not that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, an extreme leftist, has these views. It's that where are the objections from her so-called liberal colleagues? Nobody's objecting. Nobody. You say, well, how can you call the liberals and progressives communists? They're not suppressing free speech. Well, I have to tell you. A conservative on a university faculty is as rare as a unicorn. <laughs> they have suppressed free speech. They've wiped it out in our universities. Oh, people think, oh, yeah, it's, it's all free. Yeah, you're free to have this left-wing opinion or this liberal opinion. And if you're a conservative, uh, you're free to be harassed and punished by your professors if you have conservative opinions. That's the state of our universities today. I conducted a seven-year campaign on the simple principle that where there's a controversial issue in a classroom, the professor should present two sides in a fair-minded way and let the students make up their minds. That was my whole proposal. And books on both sides. Uh, and for this, I was tarred and feathered across the country. The uh, left-wing professoriate rose up in arms to condemn me. There were demonstrations against me wherever I went. That's the state of our country today. So what is this left and what, what makes it tick? Why, why does it think the way it thinks? Or how does it think? The first thing to know about the left is that it believes that people are good at heart, that we are born free, and that it's society that's the problem, and that society creates inequality, Society uh, creates greed, society creates the whole range of social problems. This idea was first uh, articulated in the modern age by Rousseau, but this is what they believe. Now, if you think about that for a second, Rousseau he famously said, man is born free but is everywhere in chains. This is an idiotic statement. But if you just think about it for a second, I mean, a baby is not free. It's completely dependent. Uh, a baby is not a cooperative person, moral person, or like young people. If you put two infants, two-year-olds, in a room with a bunch of toys and close the door, you're going to hear screams coming from that room in, a, what, five minutes. Uh, we wouldn't, if people were naturally moral, we wouldn't need morality. We wouldn't need laws. People are not moral. Conservatives understand that we are the problem. The root cause of social problems is us. How, how can you know, you have to ask yourself, how can you, as progressives do, think that government uh, can be, be a progressive force? Government, slavery, that was government. Segregation, that was government. And of course, uh, the whole totalitarian system was done by governments. Because what is a human being when they get in, into, into a position of power? It's the same human being that you want to fix, but now wields all this, all this power. However, there's something very important that flows from this delusion, and it is a delusion. And this is why, again, the, what flows from the delusion is this. Let me not, I don't want to digress. I'm a, I have a tendency to digress. I'm not going to try to digress. The, um, 
if you believe that social institutions are the source of problems, then by changing social institutions, you will change human beings and the way they behave, correct? And what will you bring about? You'll bring about uh, the millennium. You'll bring about a kingdom of heaven on earth. There'll be no poverty. There'll be no racism. There'll be no sexism. There'll be no war. Well, if you believe that, then you also think that all that stands in the way of a perfect world where everybody is going to have enough, everybody's going to get adequate health care, everybody's going to get fed. If you believe that all you have to do is change social institutions, then what do you think of the people who think that's not such a great idea, that it's not going to work, that you still will have the problem of people and their corruption and their mendacity? I mean, here we have president of the United States who's a habitual liar should be a lesson to everybody that government is a serious problem in itself. However, if you are progressive, you think anybody who has questions about the wisdom of moving forward with this grand plan to redeem the world is evil. And that's the way they treat Republicans and conservatives. You are evil. We progressives are the army of the saints. And you Republicans and conservatives are the party of Satan. And I mean that literally. It's the, ex it's the identical uh, mentality of hellfire and damnation preachers. And that's why they character assassinate their opponents. The Democrats have really one weapon. When it comes to election time, destroy Republicans, Treat, <laughs> paint them as enemies of women, children, minorities, the poor, evil people, evil people. That is the Democratic mantra. The Republicans are evil, and don't let anybody forget it. If the Republicans are elected, they'll burn black churches and just go on and on with their line. It happens in every election, and Republicans kind of jaws drop. I mean, can't believe can't believe they're doing that. You better believe it, because it comes from this core belief that people really naturally are cooperative, get together, honest, hardworking. <laughs> it's a, you know what? As I say it, it, you know maybe I've just spent too many years as a conservative. So that just seems to me. Who in his right mind could believe this? But they do. But they do. And that's what motivates them to attack the way they attack. The second thing to understand about people on the left, that's progressives, so-called liberals. I hate the word liberal because they're bigoted. They're unscrupulous. They have nothing liberal about Democrats and progressives. They're just not liberals. They hate. They, they demonize, uh, particularly white people, Christians, increasingly Jews, um, and of course people who've earned <laughs> earned their living, <laughs> people who make money. That's whom they, they actually don't hate people who make, they, they all want to be filthy rich. Uh, Obama's going to be a hundred centi millionaire shortly. Uh, the new governor of Virginia has made whatever, he's made $25, $50 million in politics. They all want, want the money for themselves because they think that they are the saviors of the world. That's the way they see themselves. They're the army of the saints. So, hey, of course, I deserve it. I know best what's, I know what's better for you or best for you. That's their mentality. But the second fundamental, in addition to thinking that people are good and society is the problem, government is the solution, they're future oriented. This is very, very important and I don't think any conservative can understand this in their bones um, the way I do having, having one spin up leftist. Future oriented. A, what I would say a normal way of looking at human affairs is to look at the past and see what worked, 
and what doesn't work, how people have behaved for thousands of years, um, and what the limits then that, that you can accomplish. How much can you change things? Have people changed in 3,000 years? Don't believe it. How could we read the Iliad? How could you read the Bible and relate to the people in it if people had changed? People haven't changed. This is the same stories for 3,000 years. You know, the technology changes, so there are aspects that change, but the fundamental people's greeds, their lusts, Cain killing Abel. I mean, come on. We see this among Republicans today. I mean, it's. <laughs> <laughs> So people, people don't change, so cons it's now the conservative view. I mean, our country has moved polarized in this way, and we now have a left, which we, a significant left, which we never had before. Um, but, you know, when the founders got together, I mean, I, you know, whatever their politics, they all had, had this common sense. In framing a constitution, we're going to look at the past, the history of monarchies, the history of aristocracies, the history of democracies. And they thought a democracy is not, you know, they thought like Churchill, it's, it's the worst system except for all the others. I mean, and they were very fearful of a democracy because they saw that people are swept up in passions. And if, if the majority rules, it's going to lord it over the, the, minor the minority, tyrannize the minority, and crush them. That's why they put in the checks and balances and the limits. Progressives don't look at the past. If they did, they would never have dreamed up Obamacare <laughs> for crying out tears. You know, socialized medicine has failed for the last 70 years. Central planning, that's what the Soviet Union was about. There are libraries of books about its failures and why it can't possibly work, and yet, they ran through this centralized system, and now it's, you know, it's coming back to haunt them. But how could a, an intelligent person, as I say, these are not stupid people, but how can an intelligent person think that you could have a centrally planned health care system that works? Ah, anyway. Progressives don't look at the past. They look at the past to discard it. That's why they all talk about a living constitution. It's, it's an old document, the constitution. Well, people don't change. So yeah, it needs, uh, you, you know, there are new technologies and there are all kinds of problems like that. But the fundamental, the fundamental core reality of human beings and their societies don't change. That's why the constitution, even though it was written a long time ago, is still the wisest political do document ever written. And, you know, we are abandoning it as we are at our peril. What progressives look at is the future. You know, we, oh, well, look, there's all these, uh, all these children who aren't learning in school. Let's increase the hours. <laughs> of the bad schools. We'll have these bad teachers teaching them longer, and then they'll, they'll long. Well, we're spending billions of dollars on these early school programs that test after test shows don't work, because it's, obviously it's not just the schools. But the future, so they, ha they have a future where everybody is, go we're going to throw money at poor people, and that's going to make them just like middle class people. No, it's not. That's the problem. It's not. But their future, in which there's perfect e there's equality, there's no war, there's no poverty, is imaginary. The difference between the past and the future, the past you can make mistakes in analyzing, but it, it actually happened, and there's actually records. The future is a fantasy. It's a delusion, and it's the core belief of everybody on the left that there is this golden future if we can just get enough power and enough money to achieve it. I, can't, I, I still have this vision of Nancy Pelosi on the day they got Obamacare through, beaming and saying, first we got 
was it Social Security? And I think bankrupt. And then we got Medicare, bankrupt. And now we're going to quadruple down on Obamacare. What could she have been thinking? Um, what she's thinking is that this is the cornerstone of the socialist future, which is what she believes in. That, you know, everything else fails because we didn't get enough money. We couldn't extract enough money because of these evil Republicans who are anti-taxation. It's an imaginary future, and that's what makes it so dangerous. These people are pumped up. Um, their own, they're intoxicated by their own self-righteousness at bringing about the wonderful world which all you and all Republicans and conservatives are determined to prevent from happening, and that's the only obstacle to them. We, human beings, are the root cause of all social problems and all government problems as well. If human beings weren't so screwed up in their way, you know, like lying, it's not hard to lie, is it? So, every, so everybody sort of does it, they're innocent, when they do the fib, it smooths things over. But then when power is at stake and when you know, wonderful goods are at stake, the lies grow and they grow and they grow until you have a president who what, 36 times told the American people you can keep your health care, we're not going to take your plan away. Lie, knowing he was lying. Why did he lie? Because as we build a socialist future, it's going to be so good, we just have to get over this hump so any, any lie will, will, that serves it will be good. The more, the more beautiful the idea, the nobler the cause, the greater the crimes you are willing to commit. If you could actually have a world where there was no war, no poverty, on and on, all these things eliminated, what lie wouldn't you, would you not tell and what crime would you not commit? And that's why progressives in power had killed 100 million people in peacetime. This is not just like Hitler did in war. In peacetime, progressives killed over a hundred million people across the communist world. Lenin did not come to power saying, I'm going to create gulags and put, and put uh, tens of million people in slave labor camps and slaughter others. That's not what he said, peace, land, bread. He had a vision of the beautiful future that Marx had promised. That's what he had a vision of. And that's what caused him to be such an evil individual as he was. The third thing, I gotta, the third fundamental problem or thing you, you, you need to watch in the left, I mean, you, you can see the syndrome, is this vision of the perfect future, the land that never existed and never will, but which you identify. Everything that you do is to get to that land. Every, every sacrifice you make Every misdeed that you excuse yourself in doing is justified by that future. Your allegiance to that future causes you to be alienated from your country. And that uncertain loyalty to country is endemic in the Democratic Party. And I'm, I'm sorry to say Republicans let them get away with this all the time. We lost thousands of young men and women to keep Iraq out of the hand, to take it, first of all, from a monster tyrant who had a mass grave with 300,000 bodies in it, and to keep Iraq from being part of the Islamo-fascist nexus, to keep Iraq independent and relatively free. Obama betrayed every single American who gave their life in Iraq by turning it over to the Iraqis without keeping an American base and 20,000 American troops as the Joint Chiefs wanted. That was an, we, we spent over a trillion dollars in Iraq and we got nothing. 
I know all those deluded, mendacious leftists who kept saying, no blood for oil. Where did the oil go? It went to China. <laughs> this, America did this out of a great goodness that is this country, made these sacrifices. And Obama just tossed it out the window. And not a single Republican said, Mr. President, you have betrayed every American who gave their life in this country. And the failure to do this has allowed Obama also to do this in Benghazi. There's no more shameful act in the history of the American presidency than Obama taking a phone call, learning at the beginning of a seven-hour battle that Americans were fighting for their lives in Benghazi, hanging up the phone and going to bed and off to Las Vegas for a fundraiser with Beyonce. And Hillary is just as guilty. And the fact that she's as popular as she is, and you know, in the polls would beat any Republican, that should make every Republican ashamed that they haven't fought the political battle. But how do they get this mentality? How can you betray your countrymen like that? Because they have a negative view of their country. And I don't care how many times Obama says this is the greatest country, that's all political baloney for public consumption. You look at his deeds. He's empowered. He's given F-16 jets. He gave billions of dollars. He gave political cover and support to the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the Nazi party of the Middle East. That's who they are. It's as though Roosevelt had funded Hitler and sent him airplanes in the 1930s. That's where the Ob and where are the Democrats protesting this? There are none. And that should frighten every American. We have some heroic Republicans who are, who are trying to bring Benghazi to the fore and bring these issues up. We need a national leaders like this. And it's a completely taboo subject, the uncertain loyalties of the Democratic Party. We have a Secretary of State who is a traitor to this country. I'm saying this is somebody who was in the anti-war movement in the 60s and who saw what we did. What we did was we caused the United States to leave the war and two and a half million, two and a half million Indo-Chinese peasants were slaughtered by the communists when they came to power. And that's thanks to people like John Kerry. But Kerry was worse than that. You know, it's one thing to be deluded and, you know, you oppose your country because that's a noble thing to do. We should not be thinking that way. Patriotism is noble, not betrayal. But, Doug, but Kerry did much worse than that. He betrayed his comrades in arms, the actual people that he fought with. He pretended that there were atrocities that he never saw and, and were not committed in order to damn them in the eyes of the world. And now he's delivering nuclear weapons to Iran under the guise of its peace. This is, this, is, this is as much peace as Chamberlain brought back from Munich. The Iranians haven't given up one reactor. They haven't had done one thing for the announcement today uh, that they're, 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 you know, we've, we've concluded a deal where we're going to remove sanctions not that they were working that well. Uh, and in exchange, the Iranians will promise. <laughs> ah! I mean, how, you can't even say these words now. It's, we're living in a surreal political, political environment. And the final thing about the left. So there's belief in the innate goodness of human beings, so that government is the solution, the state, and that people who oppose you are evil. The focus on an imaginary future instead of the real past and the real problems that we face. Conservatives are very pragmatic people. Democrats obviously aren't. Otherwise, they would never have launched Obamacare. And uncertain loyalties, because your allegiance becomes to this imaginary land, imaginary future, 
and you see your country then in negative terms. When I was, came out of the left, people would say to me, how can, how can you guys hate America so much? How, do, how does the left, how do they hate America? Well, and that's because conservatives look and they, you know, you've been to another country or you've read about it. You get, this, is incredible, this is paradise compared to 99% of the world. But if you're on the left, if you're a progressive or a liberal, you're not thinking about the real world. You, you forgot about South Africa, which is now uh, a destroyed country. You, you forget about South Africa as, as long as... You know, as long as there's not a white person as a prime minister, you don't care about it anymore. Um, but, but progressives, they're thinking about the imaginary kingdom. And compared to the paradise that progressives envision, hey, America's a bad place. Any place would be. I mean, after all, we have poor people, more poor people now that Obama has been uh, at it, and that once the progressives get power, what they do is they generalize poverty. That, that's what the experience of the Soviet Union should tell everyone, except we don't read about the Soviet Union anymore in our schools because our schools are run by these same leftists. The final characteristic of the left is its dishonesty. Very important. I'm not talking about a dishon everybody, as I said, you know, you tell fibs, you know, to make social things go more smoothly and so forth and so on. People spin, all politicians spin. Um, they're obviously conservative and Republican liars as well. No, I'm talking about a trait, a dishonesty, which is uh, endemic to the left. If you're a leftist, you're going to have to lie. And you're going to have to lie about very basic things, like you can keep your health care when you can't. Because if you told people what your agendas were, what your true beliefs were, you really think America is a bad country and needs to be taken down. And you're happy that we're no longer a significant world power thanks to Obama. In fact, you're mad at Obama because he hasn't made us even less of a power. You're mad at him for conducting the drone killings. I, I don't think those drone killings, you know, I'm good at killing people, as, uh, as the president has said. I, that's, a, that's a character flaw. I don't ascribe that to his politics. Blowing up, I mean, well, I'm going to distract myself on this one, but still. The hypocrisy of it all, you know, uh, we want to close down Guantanamo uh, because we shouldn't be incarcerating people captured, uh, you know, in terrorist attacks against us in Afghanistan without a trial. Oh, but the president can sit there by himself and, uh, you know, push a button and blow up whole families in Pakistan because they're suspected terrorists. <laughs> The hypocrisy on the left just knows no limits. Um, you cannot telegraph, you can't say what your agendas are because Americans are still in a place where they would understand something is profoundly wrong if you did so. And therefore they lie and they lie all the time. They have to. If, you, if you're defending something where you can say, well, look, if you're a conservative, you say, this worked here, this worked there, that's fine. If you have an imaginary future, which Americans will be very suspicious of because they don't want to put their lives in the hands of the government entirely, then you have to deceive them about it. And deception is what this whole administration is about. I never thought I would reach a point in my lifetime where I thought we were close or could be close to a totalitarian or a one-party state where you could suppress any political opposition and just run it uh, from then on, one party. However, if you are prepared to use the Internal Revenue Service politically to punish your opponents. 
If you have in place a comprehensive state-run health care system where you have access to the health information and economic information, financial information of every single American. And if you have a spy agency, which is such, has got such super technologies that they can read and listen into every communication between individuals in the country, you do not need a secret police to destroy your opposition. You already have it in place. And we have a president and we have a political party in the Democratic Party that has shown itself ready and willing to embrace this very system which could end our democracy overnight. That is the, that's the dark news I bring you. Now, since I never like to ruin people's lunches, although I always, I'm always just the nature of what I do is, is to depress you. <laughs> Let me leave you with one. We turn to Howard, Harold McMillan's events uh, with the most difficult thing because they're unexpected. And uh, give you this very brief story. Uh, in 1986, I was on a panel in Paris uh, organized by the Committee for the Free World where there was a meeting between the Vietnamese, the French, and the Americans. And uh, I was on a panel, and it was called, uh, the title of the panel was, or the subject, Is Communism Reversible? And none of us really thought it was. And I gave a very gloom and doom speech based on everything that I thought I knew. And lo and behold, three years later, it was gone. So don't underestimate the unexpected. If, 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 if the American people this is the, the people most unlikely to ever accept a totalitarian system. It's a country of individualists. Uh, our, our kind of core creed is we don't trust the, our government. I actually, my son gave me a t-shirt. I love my country, but I fear my government. <laughs> that, that's, that's the conservative motto. We have a country of millions and millions of people like that. I believe they're going to fail. I believe there's a tsunami coming uh, in the next congressional election. The Democrats are going to go down in flames if Republicans will just keep their hands off each other. Thank you. Okay, as we mentioned, uh, we do have time for some questions. There's a microphone uh, stage right, and uh, please feel free to uh, come up and uh, ask away. The term you use, the left, um, I prefer Andrew Breitbart's term for that segment of society. He calls it the Democrat media complex. And I like that because it brings to light the role the media plays in perpetuating this worldview. And my question would be, do you have any thoughts about what we as individuals or in the various groups of which we're a part can do to undermine the media's role in perpetuating this way of thinking? Well, we actually have a, a site called Truth Revolt, which is run by, about the media, which is run by uh, Ben Shapiro, who is also with Breitbart. Um, I mean, he works for me now, but he's got, he's got a foot in the Breitbart um, media complex. Um, look, I, to me, the most optimistic thing uh, in the last five or so years has been the emergence of the Tea Party. I, um, when I came over from the left, that's the first thing I said, is where, where's the ground war? Where, where's the army? On the right, there is none. You know, I had watched how, you know, the communist progressive left that I came out of, uh, active in the streets. We hated the Democrats when we began. Um, blew up their convention in 1968. But how that force moved the Democratic Party steadily to the left until the Democratic Party now is really, in, it's run by the people who used to run SDS. Students for a Democratic Society, the radical group of the 60s. 
Um, although I once formulated a little differently. I said the Democratic Party is a coalition of communists and crooks, and that's where I would put the new governor of uh, Virginia uh, on the crook side as opposed to the communist side. Um, <clears throat> it's not that long ago when you would not have found three conservatives willing to march on Washington because they would look at each other and say, what are we, collectivists? <laughs> That's what they would say. Um, and then, you know, we've had 100,000 conservatives marching on Washington. So the left, this is a law of unintended consequences. The left is teaching conservatives how to f actually fight. It's, it's very unconservative to want to get into a war uh, in the political arena. Because conservatives are I mean, profound believers in the, in the constitutional uh, framework. And what Madison saw and what our founders saw was a nation where there are conflicting interests, self-interests, and they have to be mediated and damped down and we can't let any one get uh, on top of all the others. Uh, but we have a whole new situation where we have this ideologically driven movement that we have to face. So I'd say get involved in your tea parties. Uh, David, a question I have. I sense that the, uh, the, the disastrous rollout of, Obama, of Obamacare is different than the other Obama scandals like Benghazi, NSA, IRS. Because well, first, you have the president out there dozens of times uh, in videotape speaking something that obviously is untrue. And second, that this impacts individual Americans' pocketbooks. They're losing their insurance. And uh, for all of us, I know what my insurance is uh, for next year, my health insurance, and it, it's up significantly. Do you think uh, the disastrous rollout of, a book, of Obamacare has a potential to you know, harm the administration more than the other scandals? If there is a God who intervenes in history, <laughs> Obamacare will destroy the Democratic Party for a generation. Uh, to uh, quote Abraham Lincoln, who's quoting the Bible, House divided against itself cannot stand. The, you understand this. They're not just demonizing us. They're ridiculing our core beliefs. What do you see as the two or three most important core beliefs that we need to be unified behind? Well, I actually... I've, I've written about this. I wrote a piece in the National Review called Uniting the Right. The big problem with the right is it is made up of conservatives who are not, not disposed to fight a political war. You know, the only time Republicans show an appetite for blood in the political arena is when they're fighting each other. <laughs> and this is true, and it's sad. Um, you can't galvanize a force capable of opposing these progressives who are religious, they're religious fanatics, and they're driven, they have a passion. You can't do that without having a passionate cause yourself. We shouldn't be talking about the debt as though it's an accounting problem. The deficit, the debt, the trillions that Obama is racking up, what is that? That's a dagger aimed at the next generations. Their freedom. They're going to have to pay that debt. What does that mean? It means they have to work more days out of the year for the government than for themselves. Every tax dollar, every, when you have to pay taxes, you just towed up the number of days it takes you to pay your taxes, that's a form of indentured servitude. I, I, I would say slavery, except that slavery is a much worse situation, but indentured servitude is actually quite accurate. I mean, I, 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 in politics, you should probably use the emotional um, <laughs> uh, metaphor, but I'm going to just say indentured servitude. Everything the Democrats do is a threat to individual freedom. When they t t take people, uh, uh, categorize them by the color of their skin, 
Democratic Party is a racist party. Progressives are racists. The Civil Rights Act of the 60s eliminated race from government and institutional regulations the progressives, the Democrats, the Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton racists restored it. So now we have kids all over the country. That doesn't matter what they, they could come from very wealthy parents and be very privileged, but if their color of their skin is dark, they're gonna get a privileged leg up in admissions policies and everything, everything else. You can thank the left for that. We have to fight a moral crusade for the equality of individuals before the law for against making people more indentured to government than they already are. In fact, that's what the tax battle really is about. We should be cutting taxes by 25% minimum. And that, what does that mean? That means that you have a, all, you know, if you're working uh, 180 days out of the year or for the government, take a quarter away. Let's do 160 so I make my arithmetic really easy for me. Audience. You're only working 120. You've got 40 days of freedom for that. Our moral cause is freedom and it should be inserted into every speech that a Republican makes, every comment on any of these issues. What Obamacare is about is taking away your freedom. Don't, you're not able to choose your doctor. You're not able to choose your plan. You're not able if you're young, and this war against young people, if you're young, you don't need fancy uh, medical insurance. Uh, you don't need pregnancy protections if you're a male. But that, the government is now building all these things into these plans and you have to accept them. It's about freedom, it's about individual choice. That's what it's about. And that's the way I would unify Conservatives. I've always noticed that people. I, I think this has got to be the last one I'm okay. looking at. Come out of the left and become conservatives. I had kind of like epiphanies, like one again. They remember the day, the hour, and the moment. Did you have a similar type of series? Oh my God, that's a whole other speech. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> did you have one like you know, a moment? I wrote a book called Radical Sun. Actually, this book, we're going to advertise this book. This, this book has a chapter called Black Murder Incorporated, which tells the story. Um, and that was, I, I, I was introduced to the Black Panther Party by a Hollywood producer. Um, I raised a lot of money um, to buy a Baptist church in East Oakland, uh, which was used to house a school for the Panther children. I recruited, I was editing the largest magazine of the left at the time, Ramparts. I recruited my bookkeeper to do the books for the school because I, I believed our own propaganda. I thought the government would shut it down. If you're a, 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 you know, a, a black radical gangster, but you also uh, portray yourself as a progressive, as Huey Newton, the Panther leader, did, you're untouchable. Um, and um, the Panthers murdered uh, this woman that I got to do the books. And that ended my career in the left. I, 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 I didn't become a conservative for another seven years. I, I was, um, it, it really took my life apart. I felt very guilty about having recruited her. Um, and my world was shattered when I understood that not only were my what I thought were my political allies were murderers, and they murdered a lot of people. That's also in this, this book and, and in, in Radical Son. Um, but all my friends were a danger to me. Because if I said the Panthers were on a pedestal for the left, and if I said that I thought that they murdered this woman, they would have attacked me as a CIA agent and a, a racist. So it was a very unpleasant experience, but it's, you know, it motivated the next half of my life. That, that was 40 years ago. Um, and I've spent the rest of my life um, atoning for what I did as a radical and what I was part of. And that, that, that's what you see today. I know you're very strong. Otherwise, I would have. This website, GodSaveUSA.com, is an expose on the teaching of Islam. You'll all enjoy it. Hi, David. Thank you so much. Everybody, uh, let's give David another round of applause.
thank you all for coming today. I'd like to remind you that books are available for purchase and custom signature in the lobby. And for those of you that have pre-purchased your books, they are out there waiting for you. Thank you. This concludes our program. Please come to our next event when it's announced. Thank you. Thank you.